Welcome everyone to Afternoon Tea with Docs. My name is Dr. Linda, emergency medicine physician, joining here from Sheffield. And I'm here with my amazing co-host, Dr. Erica, who is a GP from the West Midlands. And we are both board certified lifestyle medicine physicians. And this is exactly why we are here, because we are using lifestyle medicine already with our patients here locally. And they're seeing the amazing benefits to help them prevent and even reverse such diseases as type two diabetes, hypertension, high blood pressure, heart disease, and even some lifestyle cancers that lifestyle medicine addresses, which is breast, prostate, and bowel cancer. And of course, obesity and mental health as we are bringing you the community, coaching, and education that you need completely free of charge every single Sunday at 5 p.m. UK time. You can join us on Zoom Live so that you can actually chat with us during the session and afterwards for a 30 minute chat over a hot cup of tea. Now, if you have joined us on the live stream here on um, YouTube or on Facebook, then please do push the subscribe button and share the videos to help us spread the transformative message so that everyone can live a long and fulfilling life. If you haven't yet, do say hello on other social platforms, such as Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram, where you can follow the rest of our work and also the most up-to-date evidence-based lifestyle medicine information that can help you and your community live your best life. So today we are very delighted to have Mr. George Ampat joined us. Um, and Mr. Ampat works as a consultant orthopedic surgeon at the Royal Liverpool University Hospitals and also as a clinical teacher at the School of Medicine, University of Lip Liverpool. He is the secondary care director of the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine. And after years of surgical practice, Mr. Ampat now specializes in treating people with spine, feet, and other musculoskeletal problems without surgical intervention and with lifestyle modification. Welcome, George. Thank you. I, I'm extremely grateful to both of you for having invited me and giving me this opportunity and also for the amazing work that both of you do, uh, you know, spending your time and effort in trying to uh, promote this and also make pe uh, people aware. The difficulty is when drugs are being promoted, there is big pharma behind it. Here, there is no big pharma. It is just your sweat and your blood that you're, you know, uh, putting into this. So it is really commendable. And, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate it. I'm proud of both of you, really proud of both of you. Well, thank you so much, George, for, for your kind words. And well, actually, we were saying before we came on live that I have you to thank because uh, a few years ago in 2019, you were essentially my first introduction to lifestyle medicine. And I saw this uh, advert for a conference, the title of which was Lifestyle Medicine and Orthopedics, a powerful duel. And I was really intrigued that a, an orthopedic surgeon was interested in using other modalities to treat um, musculoskeletal problems. So I was drawn to the conference and I met you and learned a lot from you. Um, and so today we're going to share that knowledge with the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Erika. You're very kind and your memory is better than mine. <laughs> Um, and so let's start to, by us getting to know you a little bit. So how, um, yeah, what, what got you into medicine and, and orthopedics in, specifically? Sure, sure. Uh, I'm from India. I'm from South India. Uh, I'm from a state called Kerala and we speak a language called Malayalam. Uh, Malayalam is, if you write it in English, it's the longest palindrome in English because if you write M-A-L-A-Y-A-M, M-A-L-A-Y-A-M, other way around, it's also the longest palindrome. Now, uh, uh, my parents were uh, not uh, graduates, they were just, they had done schooling, uh, but they wanted their children to be doctors and they gave us the best education. 
And uh, my father, uh, at a very young age, unfortunately, stress and other issues, partly also smoking, he had a stroke. So that got me interested in the came into close quarters with medical professionals and how the treatment. So both me and my brother were inspired by what happened to my father and uh, all the medical attention that he required when and he survived the stroke and he had an mi later he survived that but lifestyle was responsible i mean uh, he was he was, you know, he was not large but uh, smoking was a big contributory factor to what he had but luckily he gave us smoking and then he lived but that interaction made me attracted towards medicine and i decided that i would like to be a doctor same way my brother also my older brother so he became a doctor then it was a greater uh, you know the uh, the passion increase and that's how i became a doctor i graduated from a medical school in uh, uh, south india actually my very close friend and uh, uh, college mate sudhi sethi is also i can see among uh, the participants today uh, he's a lovely great you know great man uh, and uh, we uh, Jipmer is uh, unique because uh, most of India was under British rule. So most of the medical, older medical colleges were commenced by the British, but Pondicherry was a French colony and uh, they started a medical school called Ecole de Medicine. And uh, this was actually started one of the first medical schools in India. And that became JIPMER after Indian independence for Jawaharlal Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education Research. And then once I was into medicine, I liked orthopedics because in orthopedics, the advantage orthopedics gave was that if someone was injured, you know, uh, at one minute, they are completely disabled, but then you can do an operation and within a couple of days, you can make them, you know, more able. And, uh, and I, I still think though, I have my reservations on surgery, you must understand that surgery is amazing. Even orthopedic surgery is amazing. It is excess orthopedic surgery that is bad. Mm. Too much is bad. And that is unfortunately what is happening. Uh, I can show you cases where you know people have had excess surgery and that is where it becomes wrong. But otherwise, someone who requires obviously orthopedic surgery uh, is a good solution. And you know we need to recommend that. But unfortunately, it is over recommended, partly from maybe from, you know, uh, financial reasons, pressures, and, you know, and if you give a surgeon the choice that he knows that he can make, you know, do an operation and do it well, then obviously, you know, he's, at, he will attempt to do it if there is a problem, but sometimes they lose their uh, perspective. Yes, operations can also cause harm. So we need to be very clear. And all these registries and guidelines do help in trying to, you know, curtail or choosing wisely websites, which tell us that, you know, when you should have undergo intervention and not needlessly, because you can also over, uh, you know, prescribe medication, you can over prescribe, uh, you know, surgery. So we need to be very careful because are we over, you know, prescribing. Then once I was doing orthopedics, then I realized that I was into spinal surgery and uh, uh, that was my you know uh, basic uh, uh, subspeciality but then slowly i realized that people were doing too many surgeries and actually there was more harm coming from the surgeries in spinal surgeries i do not know the exact figure we say somewhere between 20 to 40 percent of patients who undergo spinal surgery they land up with what's known as fail back surgery syndrome which means they have more pain after the operation than before the operation that is not good it that makes it that uh, actually iatrogenic injury that is doctors are creating this problem and they are in more pain and there is no way of escape so that's when i thought no no we should not one of the ways to prevent that is if you prevent over you know uh, prescribing surgery if you prevent that itself because the uh, you know there is something called the donabedian theorem you know donabedian is a professor and uh, it's the amount of returns that you get you start getting negative returns say if a, a population has got 100 people if you do any surgical intervention for five people who really need it you're going to get the benefit but there are grayscale people who have mild problem you do an operation so then you will find that you'll need operation for 10 people but then the, the five extra that you have done they don't get the benefit and actually there is negative returns in them so how to prevent that that's when and how to help people because unfortunately 
when the machine runs well, even the NHS, I mean, NHS is an amazing organization. I'm so proud to be on the NHS, but the difficulty is they get pathways. They want to follow the pathway. So uh, even still, uh, you know, someone who has got a knee pain goes to his, his or her GP, GP follows the pathway, sends to physio, maybe a physio sees them, they are overcrowded, the, the GP is overcrowded, overworked, same way, the physio is overcrowded, overworked, physio gives them a sheet of paper, there is no inspiration to do those exercises, they go back to the GP and say, I still have pain, then the GP says, okay, fine, let me send you to the hospital doctor, they go to the hospital doctor, then they tell, you know, I've been to all these people, I've not received benefit can you do something you're amazing he tells the hospital doctor hospital doctor okay let me do an operation for you and yet another operation is being performed so it is you know in that process why are these patients not being provided with the you know uh, with the real service that they needed uh, and uh, uh, you know when i talk about i talk to my patients and again i will talk now it's like the checkout process. You know, I tell my patients the checkout process. Sorry, am I talking too much? Have I answered too much of your question? Should I stop? No, and, no, please carry on. Okay. So I talk of the checkout process and uh, uh, I, I tell my patients, do you, what, is a, you know, uh, uh, what checkout do you want? So then they ask me, what do you mean by checkout? I say, well, it's not checking out of Tesco or checking out of uh, a, ho a hotel. I'm talking to you about something else. We all have to check out. You have to check out. I have to check out. We have to check out of Hotel Earth. One day we have to finish up, you know, time on Earth, and we have to depart. So how we depart is important. Then I say, you know, please don't mind me using these, uh, you know, uh, nationalities and geographies. It is just for the understanding. But I hope I'm able to convey a point. So I'll say I'm going to talk to you about a British checkout, and I'm going to talk to you about a Japanese checkout. And I say a British checkout is a lady who is now 86 years of age. She was in the civil service, worked until the age of 65. Then she retired. When she retired, her circle decreased, her social circle decreased. Family visited her for Easter and for Christmas, but otherwise there's not much of family. In the evening between four o'clock and 10 o'clock, she was having a conversation, but the conversation with, was with a black box in a lounge, not with any human being. So inactivity sets in. In late 60s, she breaks her wrist. 70s, she breaks her back. And 80s, she breaks her hip. And at 81, she's admitted into a nursing home and she spends the last six years of her life in a nursing home, out of which four years there is she has dementia, doesn't know what is happening around her. And then she passes away. And that is the British checkout. Contrast that with a Japanese checkout. The lady is 96 years of age. She never retired. She uh, was having a small allotment of land and she also was also doing some weaving you know, they're both, but weaving, she stopped at around 85, but she still was able to do some gardening, make some vegetables. She would sell it to the local supermarket. They have a special counter for which, you know, local vegetables produced by local seniors. And she was making some money. She would teach her two great grandchildren mathematics every day. And in the evening between six and eight, she and her mates were exercising in the park. And the age of 96, she went to sleep and passed away in her sleep. That's the Japanese checkout. So which checkout do you want? The British checkout or the Japanese checkout? Then they understand that it is the, you know, the Japanese checkout that they want. You know, it is a, and I, I tell them it is not the tablet, there's no injection, there's no medicine, no operation to get you the Japanese checkout. The only thing that will get you the Japanese checkout is a lifestyle changes that you need to introduce into your life. Uh, and then they understand because, you know, and especially seniors, and uh, sometimes it is a lack of knowledge. And uh, uh, people think that medicine is amazing. Medicine is not amazing. There are potential issues with medicine also, you know. Uh, if you look at uh, a, a study done in 2014, in uh, it's published in the BMJ uh, about uh, the medical errors that occur. Uh, I'm not trying to say that, uh, you know, uh, I'm not trying to dissuade people from going into medicine. Medicine is important, but we also need to look at it you know, rationally. If you look at the study, they uh, analyze the third greatest cause of death after cardiovascular and respiratory, the third greatest cause of death was medical errors in USA. So if you put on Google, BMJ, USA, third cause of uh, third largest cause of death, you'll come up with this. 
so uh, you know uh, it, it is important that uh, you know that we understand that medicine is not uh, a panacea without any complications we need to be careful it's a powerful instrument but more important and then uh, we think you know uh, patients come to me and say that well the doc doctor has advised surgery i need that surgery and you know something like an arthroscopy of the knee arthroscopy of the knee is not good and actually causes more harm then uh, i tell them you know you are a perfect human being you know nature or god whatever you believe created you after millions of years of research maybe you know nature created the dinosaur found it was not a good design discarded that design and then made you the perfect human being after millions of years of research then someone goes to medical school for five years he does operation for 10 years and he thinks he's better than nature how is that possible it is just not logically possible you know so you have we have the energy to make ourselves better the energy that nature gave us, the energy that evolution gave us, and we need to harness that to make ourselves better. And that is a you know foolproof system of making ourselves better rather than you know medicines or a quick surgical fix. And that is you know very very important. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I mean, we're we're getting nods in the audience. We you know getting positive um messages um feedback on what you've you've just been saying and sadly um what you talked about the british checkout is what we see every day in in general practice and and linda sees in in an emergency medicine department as well this you know lack of social contact um becoming deconditioned the sedentary lifestyle and then multiple fractures coming in becoming more deconditioned ending up with carers than care homes and dementia um, and um, that's definitely not uh, a happy thriving um, life to be living um, towards the end after so many years of hard work um, and in retirement we become less able uh, and more deconditioned and um so yeah so true what you're saying linda you wanted to yeah i love how you talked about the checkout because it's a beautiful way of sharing that we don't have to die the same way we can see that through lifestyle through the studies through epidemiology that different cultures um live differently have those different disease patterns and die differently. And very often we uh, speak to our patients about lifestyle practices and changing them to reverse chronic diseases and to help with pain. But very often the answer is that, well, we all have to die somehow. Yes, the word is somehow. The question is how, right? So important that till the last minute, we feel the best uh, version of ourselves and really tell our patients the message that we can live healthily up to our 100th year, especially today if we choose to. Is that right? Perfectly right. Perfectly right. You know, the thing, very right. I, we, I say that in one line, medicine has, in, has added years to our life, but is there life in those years, you know? we may live another 20 and 100 years ago our life expectancy was 60 now life expectancy is around 80 but are those 20 years of healthy life expectancy or are we in pain and disability the important thing is we need to be healthy till the very end so it is healthy life expectancy that is important not just the life expectancy medicine can, medicine can only come and as being doing well if the healthy life expectancy is increased and not just the number of life expectancy yeah I just want to say here that very often we think it's our age that fuels our diseases but it's very much the diseases that we acquire through our lifestyle is what is fueling our age. No, I, I completely agree. I completely agree. And for that, 
for that matter of fact you know uh, i uh, i'm quite large and uh, you know uh, it, you don't necessarily need to be you know thin uh, being uh, le less heavy is good but even for musculoskeletal problems what i say is it is like the cement and sand you know it doesn't matter whether you have a small building or a big building both the buildings are good but each building needs its right proportion of cement and sand. You can't have, say, if the, the proportion has to be one in one, then a small building will need one ton of cement and one ton of you know, sand. A big building may need 10 tons of cement and 10 tons of sand. But what happens is we may have 15 tons of sand and five tons on cement, and that is where the problem occurs. When I say cement and sand, I mean the muscle and fat. So if you have muscle, so if, if your body is muscle and you're doing the exercises, building your muscle to support your body, then that is not a problem at all. When the muscle decreases, that is where the problem is. And people have, you know, unfortunately, we have not focused on the right thing. I mean, if you talk of back pain, uh, you know, uh, every uh, person who works in a lifting industry goes through a lifting maneuver, is told about lifting maneuver, which is very good. And I think we should do those maneuvers. But equally, what we need to understand is the strength of the muscle. Unfortunately, we are not testing the strength of the muscle in many lifting occupations or in any occupation. We are not, you know, uh, uh, testing that. And that has to change. Uh, it is, you know, if you take a soldier, a soldier is a man with a gun, but giving a gun to a man doesn't make him a soldier. He needs to go through some training process. So if you're in a factory and even if you're just lifting, uh, say, a pizza from here to here, there is a strain on your back. Now, are your muscles strong enough to with stand that strain because if your muscles are not strong enough as you bend down and lift you're making it vulnerable because the strength from you know we feel that it is only the bones and joints and again when you do an mri scan when you do an x-ray you're only seeing the bones and joints you're not seeing the muscle the muscle is the most important structure even when people grow old, you know, we talk of osteopenia. People know of osteopenia, know of osteoporosis. And that is because, uh, you know, there are companies that are selling medicines for osteoporosis. But the main problem, the killer is sarcopenia, where the muscle becomes weaker. If we are able to correct, that is the root cause of the problem, not the osteoporosis or the osteopenia. If you correct the sarcopenia, make your muscles strong, the bones will become strong naturally. So you don't need these medicines. And these medicines we think are amazing. They also cause problems. You know, we'll, that is another topic. I don't want to you know, digress. So it is important. The muscle power or the cement is important. But as we become inactive, the proportion of muscle decreases and fat increases that is where the problem is it's not whether you're large or small i do agree large matters for diabetes type 2 diabetes etc but for musculoskeletal problems as long as your muscles are strong and all the muscles are strong not just some muscles it's important all the muscles are strong including your core muscles but how much muscle do we lose muscle mass over the years as we age I do not know the exact figure. I'm so sorry. I should know that. I apologize. I do not know the exact figure. Yeah. yeah. But it is, sir, sir, yes, Erica. No, no, please. But it's certainly important that the older we get, actually, the more really we should be exercising or exactly. at least putting muscle mass on because we are definitely, whatever the percentage is, it's actually not important. But with our current Western lifestyle, sedentary lifestyle where we sit about eight to ten hours in the office um, then we come home and sit on the couch a few more hours before we go to bed and we do the same cycle for about 30 years in a row we certainly after age 35 start losing muscle mass and when we are older and we often hear from our patients well i'm old i don't need to do this anymore uh, very much so this is exactly when we should be doing our uh, activities whatever we like to do, but never forgetting that we should be adding uh, muscle mass through uh, weightlifting in a way that is safe. Exactly. You know, if uh, over the age, I mean, during, you know, I think during uh, the working age, you don't lose a lot of muscle, but from 65, 
the you know the proportion of muscle loss is you know is like a geometric progression so that is the point when we have to decrease the muscle mass loss and uh, difficulty is a retired 66 year old is you know maybe watching tv for more than six hours a lot of my patients from four o'clock to ten o'clock they're watching tv uninterrupted they're watching tv and sometimes even in the morning too that is a killer and the sad point is which are, you know is uh, BBC should be telling its viewers, you know, you should not be watching us more than an hour, you know, uh, or at least get up and walk around. They don't, BBC doesn't do that. You know, they say they are a responsible company and they should be telling, don't sit, you know, and keep watching us. You need to get up and move. You know, there are programs on the computer which tell us, but BBC doesn't tell us, ITV doesn't tell us, you know, and I wish they would actually, because that is where they need to pass on the message and people sit and watch and over the 65s, they sit and they should be walking. You know, I'm not saying you should not watch TV. Please watch TV. That's important. It's educational, but equally important is, you know, to get up and walk, to interrupt that, you know, uh, uh, you know, watching the TV. So I tell my patients who have hip and knee arthritis uh, to, yes, uh, to uh, uh, use some ankle weights or small dumbbells like what Janet as you can see doing while you're watching TV. And uh, so that every, say, every time the adverts are on, say, if you put ankle weights, one kilogram weights on your ankle, you can do five times, you can do your quadriceps and five times you can do your hamstrings and five times you can do. And if you do that repeatedly, if you're even watching TV for two, three hours, every 20 minutes or 15 minutes, you're doing five repetitions. At the end of, uh, 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 you know, three hours, you've done about, you know, uh, 20 to 60 repetitions. And that is good. And you have interrupted the cycle the blood flow goes your muscles become stronger you know we just saw janet do that i'm grateful to janet for having demonstrated the what she was doing with the dumbbells and that is important we need to interrupt whereas just sitting there is stasis and tv is actually doubly harmful because you uh, know uh, one i said is inactivity but more so what happens is uh, uh, when you watch tv you are viewing uh, you know, to make it more interesting, they make uh, violent scenes or make it very dramatic. Uh, our human body is not triggered. Yes, it is triggered to react to violence, but imagine our bodies have been made over millions of years. So say thousand years ago, my father or great, 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 great grandfather went out hunting. Suddenly he sees a bear and that is, a, you know, he is, is in danger. He runs away. And when he runs away, when he sees a bear, there are hormones that are secreted into his system to help him to run away from that danger. Now, that is the reaction that nature has given us. So when you see that danger, as I said, there are hormones, your glucose level increases, your steroid levels increase to allow you to escape from that danger. But when you're watching TV, you're mentally going through that same cycle. Suddenly there is danger. You feel those emotions. And unfortunately, the same hormones are being released. Previously, when the bear was there, you could run it off and take away the excess glucose that was released. But if you're sitting and having chips and watching the TV, then you know there is no uh, the energy is not consumed. So that becomes again a waste product. It's like overfilling your car with petrol. You are pouring petrol over your engine. It is not good, and that is exactly what happens. So that is so TV watching itself is you know too much of stimulation is also and there is a direct link. There was an article I think last year which showed. If you watch TV for more than three and a half hours, there is a direct link by getting dementia uh, because of the lack of activity of the brain. Even if you play, you know, board games, you know, actually it stimulates your mind. But watching TV is not, uh, you know, stimulating it. You know, it is overstimulating and doesn't give a way of interaction. Using the computer, there is some interaction, but TV, there is no interaction. It's all one way system. Sorry, I'm talking too much on TV now. I love how you described that and explained it. And actually, the same goes for day to day stresses that we are experiencing through life, through work. Um, and we are experiencing this mental stress. And the body is also, as, as you said, um, having that hormonal response you know, having that, ex, uh, you know, uh, all the things that prepare us for flight or fight, um, but we're not actually moving to expend this energy 
um, and um, do what the body's supposed to do when we are under stress. Um, and, you know, talking about TV, maybe, maybe there should be every commercial break, there should be a, a short, you know, not commercial, but an exercise break that they lead people through doing some exercises. That would be a, a great idea. Um, also, while you're watching us responsibly, we would like to <laughs> encourage you to, if you are watching on Zoom or on YouTube, to stand up because even just standing up once every hour, moving yourself out of that sedentary life uh, really increases your health benefits, right, Erica? Yeah, absolutely. And like Janet was doing with her, you know, with her uh, weights uh, or bouncing on a on a. Um, a yoga ball or something like that to just to, to keep moving um, and um, yeah so just going back to um, we initially started um, asking you about you know why you got into medicine and I know also that you've taken a lot of inspiration from your eldest daughter um, who has cerebral palsy and is wheelchair bound and I wondered how that you know, that experience has shaped how you approach musculoskeletal problems in your clinical practice? Sure. Now, uh, uh, one thing is people are disabled and that is real too. Uh, sometimes uh, as doctors and I, I, you know, even for me, I might not have understood disability in its true sense till I saw my daughter because I thought, oh, why can't he do that? Or why can't, you know, there are exercises they can do and get better. But some people can't, just like my daughter can't, her understanding is very poor. But then, so disability is real. So someone who comes with pain, so my entire aspect of treating patients and motivating patients, because in the end, you can have the best exercise program, but if you don't inspire the patient, they are not going to you know, follow your advice. So uh, to understand and to empathize with them is very important. Sometimes as doctors, maybe not in uh, the GP land, maybe, but in orthopedic surgery, the empathy to patients may be less because they think, oh, you know, uh, they do an operation and it's not successful. They say, well, it's a patient's fault. It can't be the patient's fault. The patient has tried. Or, you know, the classic example is people with back pain. And, uh, 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 you know, uh, people, they say that one of the uh, malingering tests, there is no malingering test. There is legally no malingering test, but one of the malingering tests is the patient lifts the arm up and says, I've got pain in my back. Then it says the arm is here, the back is lower down. There is no connection between the you know, uh, shoulder and the arm and the back. So obviously the patient is lying. No, the patient is not lying. What I'm telling you is real by lifting the shoulder. And I'll tell you scientifically how lifting the shoulder will cause back pain. But that was our understanding. And that is maybe the general orthopedic understanding, but my daughter made me understand that disability is real and we need to respect people with their disabilities, whatever, if someone has severe back pain and they tell, and that is very true, they may say, just doing a sim simple moment is painful. Yes, we need to do the right exercises to make them better, but what they are telling is absolutely true, to empathize with them. And we need to understand and empathize because that is when they will do the change talk. You know, the, uh, the motivational interviewing came about from uh, treating uh, alcoholics and, uh, you know, telling someone who has got an alcohol addiction, well, you're an alcoholic, you know, you're being silly, you sh it's damaging your liver, you're going to die, stop taking alcohol, it's not going to make him stop taking alcohol. By empathizing with him or her, making them you have to be a part of them, understand their problem, why they are taking it, and then let them suggest the potential ways that they can correct themselves. So the change talk is very important. Similar way, even in back pain and neck pain, it is easy for me to say you've got you know, arthritis because you don't exercise. Yes, if I do that, they are not going to go and exercise. Yes, they have had a very rough session with the doctor. They have been made small by the doctor. But on the other hand, we need to inspire them by inspiring them and understanding their disability and give them the right exercises. Unfortunately, we also don't give the right exercises. We will come to that in a minute. And when we don't give the right exercises, they are in more pain than what they are. So 
let me uh, talk a little bit on back pain if uh, you would uh, if, if that is okay with you yeah absolutely so in back so the uh, let's talk uh, people who uh, so the same thing is continuation of the same thing on how when you do the wrong exercise it increases the pain so what happens in the lower back you have so in the uh, spine you have blocks of bones in between the blocks of bones you have the cushion so one block of bone cushion block of bone cushion so the block of bone is the vertebrae and the cushion is the intervertebral disc or what normally we call it as a short form as a disc the disc is like a jam donut with a dovey part outside and a jammy part inside we call the dovey part the annulus fibrosis and the dovey part in like the jam of the jam donut as the nucleus pulposus now, un, uh, and surrounding these are muscles, and the muscles is what gives the strength to the spine, but the muscles, they are ad adjusted into layers. So there is the first layer of the muscle, the second layer of the muscle, the third layer, and the fourth layer. And just like a gear system, the first layer of the muscle has to come into play first. The first layer of the muscle is called the multifidus muscle. So that is the smallest muscle in the back. So the, the muscle that is lying very close to the spine is a multifidus, and that has to come into play first. So when I'm reaching out my hand to even lift the spectacles off my shelf, you must understand my arm is like being a crane. So if it is like a crane, a crane can only work if the base is strong. If the base is not strong, the crane is going to collapse. So same way, as soon as my hand has left my body, immediately muscles in my lower back are contracting to hold my back stable. Because if they don't do it, it is going to hurt me more and I'm going to become unstable. Without our knowledge, our muscles are acting. The first muscle that needs to act is the multifidus. But I told you earlier that the multifidus is the smallest muscle unfortunately being the smallest and the other muscles are bigger muscles and i'll tell you why it is the smallest muscle the other muscles are big muscles but when you have pain the smallest muscle big stops working and then to wake up the smallest muscles become very difficult and the other muscles compensate and over exert but that is not going to solve the problem it will actually increase the pain i will tell you a metaphor and i hope i'm able to convey the metaphor clearly imagine a train it's got lots of compartments, giant, huge train, maybe weighing thousands of tons or whatever. I don't know what's the weight of a train, but thousands of tons. But the train is a massive train only because of the small links that connect between compartment to compartment. If those small links, which may be only a foot long, is not there, the train is not a massive train anymore. So those small in, uh, junctions that connect or the small links that connect is vital. So same way, the multifidus is the small link that connects one bone to the next, the next bone to the next. And that is crucial and that needs to work well. Why? Imagine the train again. Instead of these links, let me give you a new design to a train. Let's take off these small links, attach all the, uh, keep all the compartments together. And instead of these small links, let me have a cable going from the engine to the last compartment. And as the engine pulls on one side, it pulls the cable, pulls the last compartment, pushes all the other compartments. It'll be a very jerky journey. It is not going to be a smooth journey. And that is exactly what happens in the back when the first gear or the muscle closest to the spine doesn't act and the other muscles are acting. And that is when they seize up and you tell them to exercise, actually it causes them more pain. So then it becomes difficult. The doctor or the physiotherapist saying, go and do exercise. Patient says, well, I've done the exercise. It hurts me more. I'm not going to do the exercise. So then, you know, it is a, the, the, there is a, the purpose is defeated. Now, if it were tablets, there would be companies investing into it, trying to find out. But because telling to exercise doesn't make anyone any money, no one is investigating. But the right technique is to do the motor control exercises or to stimulate that muscle right in the center. And let me, if I can share my screen, I can show a small PowerPoint to make that uh, uh, clear. Is that, uh, uh, would that be possible? Yeah. Let me just... Uh... Yeah, can I share my screen? You should be able to. So this is actually a metaphor in my book, Free From Pain. So uh, let me explain this. So this is a car, but there is a problem with the gearbox. 
So what happens is when you start the car, it goes a bit forward and stalls and doesn't move further forward. And that is because this is the engine and an engine, the first gear engages and then you're trying to put the first gear, but the first gear falls and then it suddenly becomes a fourth gear. And that is why it is not going. There is a problem with the gearbox. It is not engaging properly. What should normally happen in a car is something like this, where the first gear engages first, then after that, the second gear engages. And then after that, the third gear should engage. And then lastly, the fourth gear should engage. If that happens, then the cycle is very good. The engine works very well and the car is able to move forward without any difficulty. But unfortunately, in the gearbox, there was a problem here. And when you're trying to put the first gear, the first gear is not falling and the fourth gear is falling. And that is exactly what happens when you have severe back pain. And let me explain what happens in the back. So this is the cross section of the tummy. So you can see the organs are in the front and this is the cut section through the vertebrae and this is the canal through which the spinal cord and the nerves are going. And these are the abdominal muscles in the front. There are three layers of abdominal muscles and these are the paraspinal muscles at the back. So these put together form all the entire core. So the muscles on the side of the abdomen, the diaphragm plus the pelvic floor muscles all together form the core. Now, if you see, I've numbered these muscles and this are the exact gear. So the, mu in the muscles in the lower back and they need to work in this order. The first gear is the multifidus, which is the closest to the spine. Its job is attaching one vertebrae to the other. That's all its job is. Then number two is the longismus. Number three is the iliocostalis. And number four is the quadratus lumborum. So just like in a gearbox, they need to come synchronously, but they don't work synchronously when you have back pain. So when you have what normally happens is the first muscle that contracts is the multifidus. Then subsequently, the other muscles contract and you're able to, you know, work the spine better. So it has to come in a synchronous fashion, just like in an orchestra, they need to play synchronously. Otherwise, it is not music. It is only some noise. So one after the other, they need to be in synchronous. But in back pain, unfortunately, the first gear doesn't work at all. It has become weak and actually MRI scans will show that is fat infiltration of the multifidus muscle. And the other muscles are working and when the other muscles are working, it is actually putting an excess strain and I, I don't know whether you saw the small wobble in the vertebrae and that increases the wear and tear and increases the chance of disc prolapse. So, but getting up the first gear to work is not easy. It takes about six weeks. I tell my patients, the first gear is like my teenage daughter. Not really now, she, both my girls are not teenage daughters, but when they were teenage daughters, I need to pour 10 buckets of water to wake them up. You know, one bucket won't be enough. <laughs> so it takes a long time to wake up the multifidus muscle. And one of the ways, simple ways is pulling the belly button to the spine. So when you pull the belly button, the transverse abdominus is contracted. So as you're, you can do it in four ways, we need to do it. So while you're sitting, you pull your belly button and that's, I'm doing it now. You can still speak. You can still take in a breath and leave out a breath and hold it for a count of 10, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, relax. So by doing that, you are actually stimulating the multifidus. If I told you that you needed to develop the biceps, it is easy, you can take a dumbbell and develop the biceps, but the multifidus is deep inside. And the only way, and you cannot feel the multifidus, nor can you make it voluntarily contract. The only way you can voluntarily make it contract is by attracting the transverse abdominus. So the transverse abdominus is this muscle which is there in green. So when you pull in the belly button, what happens is the transverse abdominus contracts and along with that, the multifidus also contracts. And that is the only way you can do it. But as I said, you need to pull on the transverse abdominus 120 times each day for a period of six weeks. So each time you do it, you need to do it for a count of 10 and 120 times. So doing it 10 times is one set. So ideally, you need to do 10 repetitions or three sets while you're sitting, 10 repetitions or three sets while you're standing. 
10 sets, uh, ten, sorry, 10 repetitions of three sets while you're lying down and in the quadruped position. So each 30, 30, 30, 30 will totally make about 120 repetitions. And not alone that, most important to get because it is both the training for the mind as well as for the back that is important it is when you're doing any activity when you're taking a book from a shelf you're taking a bottle from the shelf you're taking your spectacles from your table you need to pull your belly button because it is not just the muscles that in the core that need to be developed it is also your brain needs to understand that this muscle needs to contract so you're training your brain as well as training your back to do this contraction of the muscle that is when it stabilizes the right synchronous you know uh, uh, way the contraction goes is important so that is what we need to do we need to get it working in this order one two the first the multifid is working then the longest mess iliocostalis and the quadratus lumborum so it is looking after the small muscles and the bigger ones to look after themselves and this is the book the free from pain book uh, which is mainly uh, meant for seniors about the age of six where this is my latest book and uh, you know it gives you the different uh, you know exercise there are three different exercises we have put together for the seniors one is the otago exercise program uh, which came out from south island in new zealand and it is good for uh, you know uh, improving balance balance is a big issue in seniors and the serendipitous discovery was that it is also helps with musculoskeletal pain and it also contains the motor control exercise which i just said and the isometric exercises for the neck and the shoulder so doing a combination of this over you know a three month period and repeating that every three months is going to make you know the muscles potentially stronger and less amount of uh, you know arthritis and uh, you know uh, need for further surgical intervention yeah and the, and as you can see there no amount of medications or surgeries will be able to help you train that muscle in the first gear that is needed um, for smooth um, and effective execution of our of our activities yeah 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 um very very interesting um and actually back pain is something that is so so common um i see in general practice all the time uh, and linda sees people coming in with with back pain also um and often people would want um so we, we've identified that actually sedentary lifestyle um, and, you know, lack of use of the muscles will lead them to become deconditioned um, and it can actually exacerbate um, and increase our risk of having back pain. Um, and so because back pain is so common, about 60 percent of people will experience back pain at some point in their life. 85, 85%. Um, 85%. Okay. So um a huge number of people will experience back pain at some point in their life. And at what point should people be worried uh, and seek medical attention for, for their back pain? Yeah. When mechanical back pain is just common. And it is important that you are doing the right type of exercises and making the core strong. And people attribute, and some of our education is also wrong. And uh, I will tell you another metaphor, which, um, you know, uh, uh, sorry, I hope I'm not boring you with my stories, but hope it is educational. It's like uh, Peter and Paul. So they are twins, they are identical twins, which means their genetic material is the same. There is no difference in their genetic material. Peter works in a removals company, Paul works in a bank. So Peter is lifting three tons every day from the house to the uh, van, from the van to the uh, you know, uh, house. He's lifting three tons every day. Whereas Paul, his twin brother, all that he's doing is pushing a pen on paper and pushing a few keys on the keyboard. Now, over the weekend, they're doing going to do gardening and they have to lift a few pots. And Peter, the guy who is uh, uh, in the removals van, he lifts the pot in any way, not any, you know, by the right technique, but nothing happens to him. Paul, the guy who works in a bank, he researches how to lift, lifts it the proper way, but still hurts his back and blames the lifting as the cause of his back pain. 
but was lifting the cause of his back pain or was he fit to lift? The most important thing is, was he fit to lift? Peter was lifting three tons every day and technically if lifting was the cause of the problem, dose wise, he would have had a problem in his back, but he didn't get a problem. But that was because his muscles were strong, whereas Paul, his muscles were not strong. So we have the wrong idea about, you know, that lifting, but it's not, it's, we need to make our muscles strong. So if you're strong, then you can lift. And the uh, next thing is we have as, you know, I don't know whether you get that uh, patients come to our patients and say, I want an MRI scan. And I, I'm not blaming the uh, patients because uh, they have been given that spiel by doctors that MRI scan is the be all and end all. And then the worst thing is the MRI scan will be reported as showing degeneration and, uh, you know, of the uh, uh, spine, uh, uh, you know, and uh, there will be some comment that is degeneration, this disease then that actually worries the patient. So they come and say, oh, I've got this significant problem. I, I was reported two of the discs are dis, you know, uh, degenerate. There are two disc bulges, so my spine is you know, bad. So I tell them, you know, sorry, I'm not being uh, rude when I say that. I say, you know, have you been using you know, L'Oreal or what have you been using for your face? But even then, your, you know, your skin shows your age. It is not, you, you don't still have baby skin. So if after all those creams and potions, your skin is showing your age, then your spine also should show your age. Your, you know, you're 50 or 60, your skin shows that you're 50 or 60. If, you know, if your skin was baby skin, I want to know the cream that you're using. The same way, if your spine, you're 50 or 60 years of age, your spine will be 50 or 60 years of age. It cannot be a baby spine. And if it is, you know, if it is showing that age, those changes that you see, the degenerative changes, the bulges are just common. It is not my balding and my gray hair is just normal it is not abnormal at all so same way some degeneration may be slightly more some may be less to make them suddenly pathological if you had a baby spine then it is a miracle you cannot have a baby spine you have heard lived years of life you have worked years of you know in many years and obviously there will be the wear and tear of those years so unfortunately the mri scan becomes a big focus and uh, I, I do not know whether you know doctors want to push it onto MRI scans and patients get worried about MRIs. And there was a, actually a very good study, which uh, I, it was done by a person called Modic. And uh, they did 100 MRI scans on patients who had back pain. And for 50, the results of the scan were told to the patients. For the remaining 50, the results of the scan were not told to the patients. So the people who got the results of the scan suddenly we're told there is degeneration, there are disc bulges, it's just touching the nerve. The other 50 lived in total bliss of what their scan showed. At the end of one year, they compared the mental you know, agony about back pain on the patients who were told the results of the scan compared to the people who were to, not given the results of the scan. They found the people who were given the results of the scan were psychologically affected by the results of the scan and they thought their backs were very bad. Whereas the other people who didn't know about the you know, uh, back at all, or what the scan said, were completely, were, uh, you know, blissfully unaware of any, what was happening in the back. Obviously, there was nothing seriously wrong. So it is important that we don't needlessly do MRI scans because, you know, you're going to report natural changes which occur as pathological changes. These are just natural. My balding is just natural. My graying is just natural. It's not pathological. I don't need to go and get treatment for that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and and in terms of so yeah, people do ask for for MRI scans, but initially, uh, definitely in general practice, people often come in wanting uh, to have an X-ray to start with, and as you already touched on earlier, the muscles are the you know really really important in terms of uh, our, our experience of pain and how much we can move. Um, and x-rays don't give us that information about how our muscles are performing and whether we have sarcopenia. Exactly, yes. And, and, and the worst thing is x-rays are counterproductive because it, say, for instance, I'm very, very rare, but even if there is a significant pathology, it may not be picked up on x-rays. And then you're getting a false reassurance that everything is okay when everything is not okay. 
So an X-ray is contraindicated in mechanical back pain because you're giving them the wrong impression. And it is not the bones that matter, it is the muscle. And the X, as you very rightly said, the X-ray doesn't pick up the muscle. So doing an X-ray is just doing something to please, seem to be doing something rather than actually doing something which is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we should not be just seen to be doing something. We should be doing something which is worthwhile and beneficial to patients. So, you know, uh, they're very yeah, important. And, and, the, and the worthwhile and beneficial to patients, what would that be? Well, I think patients with just mechanical back pain should understand that x-rays and investigations are not required they should take so what i do so young uh, i have to say the you know one of the examination techniques that which i have written about is a plank so i have a 25 year old let's say i've got a 25 year old coming with back pain i examine them and i see that there is no neurological deficit i make certain there is no uh, you know, uh, cord equina syndrome. Then I say, I'm going to do the last test and uh, we'll do it together. Or sometimes I make them do it and then I do afterwards. I'll say, I want to test the strength of your muscles. So, uh, you know, let's do the strength of the muscles. And I do a forward plank with them. You know, what's a forward plank? You are on your uh, elbows, on your forearms and on your toes, and you're keeping the body away from the, you know, flow. And there is some evidence that actually, if you do a two minute uh, forward plank, uh, you are protecting the spine. The core is strong enough to protect the spine. So I have 25 year olds after 15 seconds, they say they can't do it anymore. Whereas I'm there, 59 year olds still doing it two minutes. Then they, then I ask them, who do you think is older? Are you older or am I older? I ask them. <laughs> then they get the point. And, <laughs> and, you know, then I explain, I mean, obviously, explain to them that the strength of the muscle is important and how they should slowly build up. Unfortunately, when you have back pain, as I told you, the multifidus goes to sleep and it is very gently we need to get. So that's six weeks. So I treat back pain by giving the SSS. I say the SSS, the first six weeks is synchrony. So they are only pulling the belly button to the spine for six weeks. Then comes the strength, the second S. So first is synchrony, getting like the orchestra to, so the first gear should fall. Then it is the strength. I get them to build up the strength for the next six months. That is, they need to do the plank, forward plank for two minutes or a back plank or a bridge for 180 seconds. This uh, two minutes is for a man, for a woman, it is only 90 seconds. Sorry. Yeah. That is what the literature shows that that's, that's strength enough to protect their back. And once they're able to do that, then you know their backs are protected and they will not have back pain so my patients i don't give them mri scans or you know x-rays i make them do this then they understand that it's the strength that they need to build up i say when you do this they come back then if there is still pain i will do the mri scan and you know very rarely does anyone come back after that i mean you know and uh, not that they they understand the problem that is a weakness of the muscle and they need to build up and the fact that i'm also doing it with them you know, uh, it, it drives home a point very well, you know, and they see my bald head and gray hairs. and They, <laughs> they can't do it as much as I do. Uh, it, it drives the, it drives home the point. So, you know. Uh, What's the third S? Oh, the third S is the stretching. So synchronous strength and stretching. Many people believe that the stretching should come first. The stretching should not come first even in strength first so in the back first synchrony pulling the belly button for six weeks then up to that for six months you build up the strength slowly increase so maybe monthly you can increase the amount so every day you're doing exercises to build up the strength so only core strengthening exercises you don't need to stretch after that if you want you can that is not it is completely optional the stretching you want to bend down and touch your toes you want to bend down you know do the different stretching programs you can do but that is not essential at all for you to lift stretching is not important the strength is more important and the synchrony in the strength but if you want to achieve so, you know stretch at that point that is uh, you know um, no issues at all yeah. You're, you're treating back pain with synchrony, strength, and uh, optional stretching. Yeah. I didn't hear mention of any pain relief analgesics in there. Well, yes. You know, you can take painkillers, but, you know, painkillers are not the answer. And I tell this to my patients also. Uh, I tell them, you know, you come to me in January, I give you tablet A. 
You come to me with pain again in June or July and I give you tablet A and tablet B. Then you come to me in December and I give you tablet A, tablet B and tablet C. In that year, who benefited? The sufferer of pain or the shareholder of the company that makes these tablets? So it is important that we need to get you know, the muscles working. But equally, if they are in severe pain, they need painkillers. You know, There is no doubt about it, especially if there is an acute disc prolapse and they are in severe pain, they need the right painkillers to decrease their inflammation or, and to give them pain relief. Because if you don't give them pain relief, they are not going to exercise. So I'd rather have a patient with severe pain taking what i really don't like is chronic pain there is no evidence that chronic opiates for chronic pain other than drugging them making them addicted to opiates there is no you know advantage at all and unfortunately we have gone into that cycle and uh, also injections to the back injections to the back are harmful and i don't know why the nhs still uh, does these injections in some places they repeatedly do injections people are hooked on to them you know there are places Places where if you leave the GERFT uh, uh, released, uh, I think two years ago, shows of hospitals where patients go every three months and get an injection to the back. And uh, the steroid, uh, the building block of the body is collagen. So the same way the building block of the construction industry is steel, whether you build a bridge, whether you build a house, whether you build a factory, you need steel. So same way to build the body, we need collagen, you know, we need collagen in our skin, collagen in our soft tissue, collagen in our bone, collagen in our muscle. Now, steroid is directly harmful to collagen. What sulfuric acid will do to steal and melt steel away, that is what steroid does to collagen. So if an old lady who has got back pain and you know whose muscles are already weak, you're giving them the steroid injections repeatedly, you're making the muscles even weaker further. So you are actually damaging them. And yes, they may be, you're giving them, you know, yes, it is like a sugar rush. If my child asks me for food, if I give them a Coca-Cola, yes, they'll be suddenly you know, their hunger will go away because of the sugar rush. But other than the sugar rush, it produces an actually detriment in the long run. And we give them like Smarties, you know, some uh, pain clinics just give injections so repeatedly. But there are clear gui nice guidelines that it should not be given. And same way, even for disc prolapse, I'm not 100, I mean, in severe disc prolapse, severe pain, uh, in a foraminal injection is important. But otherwise, what happens is this, the, if there is a disc prolapse, the body's immune system eats away the disc that has come out. So if you have a disc perhaps the nucleus pulposus has come out and so the jam comes out of the jam donut, the body's warrior cells or the macrophages come there and eat away the nucleus pulposus. So it is like I tell my patients, like my blob of jam is there on my table, but I have some friendly ants in my kitchen. I leave the blob of jam there. By the next day morning, the friendly ants have also fed. They have come and eaten the blob of jam and my table is clean. So they are happy. I'm happy. And that's exactly what happens to the disc prolapse. So giving a steroid takes away the macrophages, takes away the, you know, the friendly ants. So, you, you know, but in severe pain, you need to interview. And yes, we need pain relief. Without pain relief, you can't exercise. So there has to be a judicious mix. I mean, Painkillers are important. Even surgery is important. If you have a significant dysprolapse with neurological deficit, you have cordyquina syndrome, you need surgery. But the small dis bear in doubt, should I operate? Shouldn't I operate? They don't need an operation. If you do an operation, you're going to cause them harm. Where there is clear, massive dysprolapse, causing disc you know, pathology, causing radiculopathy, you need an operation, no doubt on it. But the small cases, oh, should I operate? And then patients who, you know, they are very vulnerable and patient in pain has come very, very vulnerable, you know, and you tell them, yes, I could do an operation. You know, they are going to clutch on to the last straws. It's like someone who is drowning. You give them a straw to clutch. They want to hold, grab onto it. And they, you know, grab onto it. And actually, there's more harm. As I said, fail back surgery syndrome, you know, is uh, very common. Can I just show you one uh, uh, case report that I had published? Uh, uh, I know not about backs. It is about knee. I'll just share that uh, with you. And I can give you uh, a PDF of that if you want to send it to your you know, listeners. Let me just open that. Give me one minute. Sorry. Sorry. 
So I don't know whether you can see my uh, screen. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a 52 year old lady. This I had, I can send you this article. This is reported in the BMJ case report. So 52 year old lady, she had just an injury to the knee. And unfortunately, uh, she went to a surgeon uh, in uh, St. Elspeth's Hospital. And this was the X-ray taken. And the X-ray, if you see, shows no arthritis at all. So this is a weight-bearing X-ray. She's standing on it. And you can see there is good cartilage, both on the outer side of the knee and the inner side of the knee. But she had severe knee pain. And the surgeon said, yes, I think you need an operation. And she was given a knee replacement. So this is her final X-ray after the knee replacement. And she's no better after the knee replacement at all. She's actually more pain now than before. So she's had an operation with which was not needed at all and now you know it's uh, you can't undo the operation you can't you know it's uh, you know uh, you can't take away the effect of an operation so talking of that let me just give a metaphor for people to understand can i share my screen once again i'm sorry i hope i'm not uh, giving you too many things to uh, view let me just share sorry one minute i'm just getting oh, sure. And look at looking at that x-ray the initial x-ray um and i remember learning that people's symptoms don't always correlate with the x-ray findings in Very true. the case yeah. of uh osteoarthritis so people can have very severe arthritic changes on x-ray and not have many symptoms of pain um and and people with minimal changes on the x-ray can on the other hand, have severe pain. Um, and actually, in, in children with arthritis, they often tend to experience less pain because they are a lot more mobile um, than, than older adults with joint pains. Um, so they're, you know, encouraging people to, to exercise uh, in a way to improve the range of motion in the joint also helps to alleviate joint pain. That's exactly what you have done, Erica, isn't it? Yeah. If you don't mind sharing that you are actually suffering from it for a very long time. Yeah, so I, from, from the age of about four, I've, I've had um, joint pains uh, in my knees um, and sometimes in my hips, um, but mostly in my knees. And I used to cry myself to sleep when I was little. Um, and um, at university, I had an x-ray, which actually showed some um, osteoarthritic changes in my knees, which my GP initially didn't believe and thought I was just being a hypochondriac because I was a medical student. <laughs> um, and, but in the end, she sent me for an x-ray. Um, and um, so I, I started to actually strengthen my muscles. So I started going to the gym, um, doing strengthening exercises, not, not specifically cardio, but I, I used to go on the strider and increase the resistance so that I was use, using my muscles. And I bought resistance band um, to exercise with at home. Um, and those things really helped me with my knee pain, especially when I was on ward rounds. Um, when yeah during my my clinical pit placement and standing there for hours on ward round that was really killing my knees um and never did i take any pain relief actually um even when i was in in a lot of pain a beautiful example of how lifestyle changes can really help at any age and and yourself as well linda you you've helped someone very close to you who was uh living with a lot of pain to now living a very active lifestyle cycling all the time um, by using lifestyle measures to manage their osteoarthritis. Yes, and it's beautiful to see because it is in the family. So to be able to use lifestyle medicine with those who you love have such a beautiful benefit because not only are we giving the drugs, but we are actually prolonging their life 
quality rather than just their age. And may I just share, we have also on our walk detox sessions that we are offering in Burley Health Center. We just got off a lady off of her gabapentin, which has been on for a really, really long time for lower back pain. Um, and just by joining us every week, after four weeks, we were able to start reducing her gabapentin um, with the help of the GP, of course. And now after eight weeks, she is completely lower back pain free. And of course, it was helpful that she was in a supportive, helpful community. And also, she felt encouraged, as you said, Dr. Ampat, we have to inspire our patients and not just tell them that they can, we have to give them the go. And I think that's why we are so privileged as doctors because we can actually ignite change in our patients and why it is so dangerous if we don't do just that. Why it is so painful to see patients walk by our office just because we are busy and not give them that kind of, you can do it, you can reverse your chronic disease, you can get moving um, just because we are very, very busy in the office. It cannot be an excuse. And this is exactly why we are here today and we couldn't be more passionate about this. So thank you so much for, um, for joining us uh, with and sharing this message with us. I um, would love to see if you have another um, screen share for us as well. Can, can I just the last one and then I'll, uh, you know. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's, been, it's been such an interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. You're really kind. I'm learning a lot. <laughs> And also uh, just want to say here, our um, guests who have joined us, they have read your book and you have changed their lives. So um, I just, now that we are talking about book, I've been very excited to show it. Erica, would you show it to our guests here on camera? Um, that's, okay. yeah, that's my earlier book that yeah. recently I brought about the free from pain book. Yeah. yeah. So everybody who is looking at their muscle pains uh, and would like to actually improve their um, structure overall, uh, please have a look at Dr. Trumpat's book. Thank you. Thank you. So let me share one more thing. It's about surgery. So this is again a story. So just to make people understand. So this gentleman here on top of one building, he wants to go to the top of the next building. So there are two options possible. So the one option is that sorry there are two options possible one option is he can directly jump across there's the two buildings are really about five feet apart so it is within a jumpable distance or the other option is he has to go down the one entire building cross at ground level and then climb up the other set of buildings so it is a long arduous task but it is much more potentially much more safer so let's see what he does so the one option is, as he said, in a successful surgery, he's able to jump from there, reach the other side. He has you know, reached the other side. It, the uh, outcome has been good and it is a successful surgery. But unfortunately, we can't always anticipate that. There are times we may not jump that gap and we are actually falling. And that's when the disaster strikes and people have an operation. And, you know, even if you if I buy a house and I don't like it, everything in life can be given away. Like you buy a house, you don't like it, you can reduce the price and sell it off. Or you buy a car, you don't like it, you can reduce the price and sell it off. You buy a watch, you don't like it, you can sell it on eBay. But once you've had an operation, you can't sell it off on eBay, you're stuck with it. So if it goes wrong, you know, it's very difficult to correct it. It's like a surgical complication. Whereas, you know, you need to attempt non-surgical options. So yes, it is difficult, but it is safer, much more safer to do it. Yes, it is slightly difficult, it takes a longer time. You need to climb down the entire flight of uh, the building and then cross on ground level and then climb the you know, other building up. And there is, it is much more safer, 100% safe, and you've reached where your destination was. And that is what is non-surgical. Now, important, you know, for all you know, your uh, patients, I don't know whether you know of the site called Choosing Wisely, that is by the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. And they give this uh, in very good information. And that is important. Whatever surgery you have, look at this and they have their own, uh, you know, for each surgical procedure, they may have the, you know, the uh, guidance and they ask patients to follow the brand, B-R-A-N. 
brand is what are the benefits what are the risks what are the alternatives what if i do nothing so if you're being offered an operation by a, a doctor you need to ask them four things you know ideally you need to take a paper and pen or a, in a book and pen and ask the doctor tell me what are the benefits of this operation number two doctor tell me what are the risks and thirdly what are the alternatives and uh, lastly more importantly what if i do nothing and if doing nothing may also make you better, why don't you try doing the nothing or just doing the exercises or lifestyle? Because many times doctors think you have come to the end of the tether and they need to give you an operation. And usually doctors visit the benefits and risks, but doctors don't visit alternatives and nothing. And it is important that doctors are visiting alternatives and doing nothing. So the brand is a very good mnemonic for patients to remember when doctors are advising them for surgery or any intervention you need to ask them the four questions brand remember brand what are the benefits what are the risks what are the alternatives what if i do nothing and that should help you you know handle you know the uh, uh, and understand before you're subjecting because you must understand like what i told you if you have a house you buy a house you don't like it you can sell it but if you have an operation there are no thank you, you know, for watching i yeah, so, hope sorry you sorry sorry this video sorry that was a part of my video and that was my recording i apologize for that yeah good nice. any questions that's brilliant. Thank you so much, George. Um, honestly, it's been it's been such an informative session, and I'm sure we've we've all learned a lot. Um, and you you mentioned um, about the the non surgical options and lifestyle. And actually, in in this book, your earlier book, you also mentioned that in managing joint pain, um, that a plant based diet may be helpful. Um, could we just touch on that? Because I, I know we're running out of time, but um, are you able to just touch on that? Sure. Sure. Exercises and uh, exercises also one more advantage it has is uh, uh, exercises produces endocannabinoids. Okay. So what is endocannabinoids? Uh, uh, you know, we all know of cannabis, marijuana and uh, the body produces its own marijuana or like marijuana and that's called endocannabinoids now when we talk of runners high so people who run at the end of the run they feel so energetic and really high and that is because the endocannabinoids have been released into their body same way strenuous exercise produces the endocannabinoids you won't feel pain you know, as I said, we have been, you know, been prepared over millions of years. So my great, 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 great grandfather who lived 10,000 years ago, he was going hunting, say, and he went hunting. Then suddenly, uh, first day hunting, he couldn't get anything. And then he's tired. And then suddenly a bear comes and he has to run away from the bear. And that time the endocannabinoids are released after and he's able to run away from the bear without any problem. So that how exercise helps is by endocannabinoids. Now coming into why a plant-based diet is good. There is a significant link between microbiome and pain. So, so just like how we say, uh, you know, uh, forgive me for using these words, but big poo, less risk of colon cancer small poo big risk of colon cancer same way big poo less pain small poo big pain it's very very true uh, sorry i'm using the words poo on uh, the program but that is entirely true so if i eat white bread with a burger inside it is so good my body absorbs everything there is nothing for the millions of bacteria in my tummy but on the other hand, I have broccoli, I have, you know, a whole uh, bran, I have, uh, you know, uh, sweet potato, I have uh, courgettes, there's a lot of fiber, the fiber goes to the millions of bacteria in my tummy. And we do not know all the factors that are being released, but there is a clear link between the microbiome and so if the health of the microbiome is makes you your pain less you know active and pain is very 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 subjective phenomenon and you know it is not the fault it's not people i mean i tell this to patients patient says 
am I imagining it? No, 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 they are not imagining it is real. And that is the way the body has been created. So let me, uh, you know, I'm sure all of you know this, and I'm sorry if I'm uh, teaching uh, Nan to suck eggs, but when, say, for instance, I, a pin pricks my finger here, for that pain, so if it pricks my right finger, it goes to my left side of my brain. So from the from here, how does it go up to the brain? It is not one nerve fiber. There are three nerve fibers. So there is one nerve fiber from the tip of my finger to just inside the spinal cord. That is the first nerve. Then there is a junction. And at that junction, actually, bottles break. Chemicals are released from the bottles into the next nerve. Those chemicals irritate or the neurotransmitters. The second nerve goes from the base where the entry into the spine to the base of the brain and then from the base of the brain to the, you know, the cortex. So there are three nerves, three nerve fibers, not just one nerve fiber. You would think it is quicker if it is one single fiber, but nature made it into three fibers. And it made it into three fibers because we can modulate, the brain can modulate the pain. So yes, I have severe ankle pain, but though I have severe ankle pain, suddenly a tiger walks into the room. I'm not going to say I've got severe ankle pain. I'm going to count the stripes on the tiger. I'm going to run and I'm going to run like I've never run before because at that point, new bottles are broken, new uh, neurotransmitters are released that my pain disappears and I'm able to run. But equally, those chemicals can be changed. So for instance, that day, a few days you know, uh, ago, not again a joke not real my wife shouted at me my daughters shouted at me and then a tiniest pebble fell on my foot and you don't know how painful that was are you with me so we are all subjected to the pain can be a very subjective phenomenon. that's not your fault that is the way the body is that is the way the body is it's not anyone's fault no one is putting it on no one lies you know everyone it's when they say it is genuine so we need to educate them and explain to them so it is modulation of pain is important and what we know is the microbiome helps us to modulate this pain so we are able to feel the less pain just like how uh, forgive me for saying this again just like how after a run you feel a runner's high after a good poo you feel very good too sorry <laughs> You know? It's very true, actually. Absolutely, like there's not much that's above in the enjoyment level than that, <laughs> to be honest. So, uh, especially with patients who have a lot of uh, constipation, and more and more we see that in the Western world, this message is so important. Countries that, as you said, that have bigger poos have smaller hospitals. And those who have smaller poos, unfortunately, have bigger hospitals, exactly. like just like here in the West, right? Yeah, yeah. No, no, I agree. This, I completely agree. This is so useful. Thank you so much for your incredible stories, uh, Dr. Ampa, and for bringing this with so much humility to our patients. Um, honestly, I just wish so much that we had more orthopedic surgeons like you. And I would love to ask if the, our patients are suffering from any MSK pain, where could they find you to have your expertise? So I, I, I mean, you can find me on my website. My website is www.ampat.co.uk or otherwise, yes, you put it up or freefrompain.org.uk or bandaid.co.uk. Yes, you're given all the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see it on the chat. Thank you, Erika, yeah. So these will give you the, yeah. Yes, it is also in our YouTube youtube chat as well and just to say about your book once again uh, we had so much positive feedback from our patients here on the zoom chat as well uh, that you have changed their life for good so thank you so much for publishing this much needed information thank you thank you thank you very much yeah lovely lovely and thanks a lot for giving me this honor to be with you this uh, afternoon thank you I'm honored. It's our pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, so for all of us uh, who are here on Zoom, you will have the honor to have a little chat uh, in a non-recorded version with Dr. Ampat uh, and ask your questions like always every single Sunday. And for those of you who have joined us on the live stream on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. Please, to support our work, hit the subscribe button and share this video with everyone you love so that everyone can live without chronic disease, without uh, pain, lower back pain, one of the most common problems. So this talk will really help them on addressing this with lifestyle changes.
If you haven't said hello yet, please do so on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, and also on LinkedIn with the um, tag Afternoon Tea with Docs. And if you haven't seen our website, it's afternoontvdocs.com. And a pretty cool offering that we have for everybody um, out there in the UK uh, and NHS patients is a free referral into our new course that will be opening soon, the uh, Lifestyle Medicine Chronic Disease Reversal Program. That's a three-month program to address chronic disease. So you can apply now for that completely free of charge, and we will let you know when it's starting. So you can find that on our website. Thank you very much for joining us once again. We hope to see you next Sunday. Have a lovely week ahead. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Anna.